Hey everyone, welcome back to part two. We are with the incredible Tej Singh. If you haven't checked out part one, we talk everything about how to get started in property, so go check that out. And now we're gonna be talking about raising capital for your property business or even actually just the business that you run. It's all gonna tie in as one. So the reality, Tej, if someone's starting out, not everyone has the money to get into property. That is the reality of it. Okay, you're probably watching this thinking, I wanna get into property, you've started my educational journey, brilliant, but I've got no money, so how do I do that? So the first question to you, Tej, is someone looking to start out, how can they go about perhaps getting some funds in their back pocket? Where does that really start? I think, and people will agree and disagree with this, you know, getting your first deal funded by an investor, especially 100% of you know, the purchase and the costs, I think it's difficult because I kind of look at myself and I, and I speak to other investors and, and we kind of say, look, well, you've got this, this veteran over here who's done, I don't know, 10 deals, not really a vet, but you know, they've got scars that have healed. They know how to fix problems. They've got a network. They've used investor money before. They're safe. And you've got the newbie, no property experience, not so much a network, no scars, and they're about to get cut up big time by this first deal. I mean, I'm giving my money to the vet. Like, I don't care. It's as straight up as that, I'm giving it to them. I don't care how impressive this dude is, I'm giving it to them. And I think people have to realize that, you know, yes, these training courses and we'll say, oh yeah, you fund your first deal, you know, no money down, all this stuff. But actually, it is possible, don't get me wrong, from family and friends perhaps, but I think you need to put yourself in the investor's shoes. Look at your bank account right now, everything in there, who would you give it to? Yeah. The chances are you're probably gonna give it to the same person I would. Yeah. So, you know, when it comes to funding your deal, especially for the first one, speak to family and friends because they've known you, you know, your parents have known you since you were born. Um, you know, they probably have funds, you know, the rich auntie, the rich uncle you don't know about. Speak to them and, you know, don't say, oh yeah, it's my fifth deal. Just say, look, it's my first deal. You know, I'm happy to give you a first charge or whatever the security is. I'm happy for you to you know, even join venture a little bit or give them, a, give them a crazy interest rate just for that first one. But you need to do something to convince them and show them that it is safe to invest in you. And on the, the other side of that page is that you need to be investable. So, you know, your deal analysis needs to be shit hot. You know, people come to me and say, Ted, I've got a BRR and it's like a 10% return. I'm like, that's not a BRR. And you know, you need to be going to them saying, look, here's my, you know, 20 field spreadsheet. Here's yeah. every single eventuality. So you become more investable. Yeah. So that's what I'd say on the first deal in particular. So key takeaways there, you just said about knowing your numbers. That is so, there's nothing, I think if you're going to ever present something to, by the way, always start with family and friends, because if you have no track record, it's going to be really tough. That's the reality of it. Just like Tej says, if, if an investor sitting here as an investor has got someone who's brand new or a vet, someone who's done a lot of projects, for, for security and peace of mind, you're going to go with someone who's yeah. done those projects before because, you know, projects before and the pipeline speaks for itself. So mm -hmm. start with family and friends yeah. and know your numbers because just from experience, there's nothing more off-putting to an investor when someone turns up and they're like, uh, so these are the kind of numbers I think it works. As soon as they have your money, it's done. The confidence is lost. So really know your numbers, know property inside out. Mm. Um, talking about what you do is so key and, yes. and networking. So what tips have you got from talking about what you do and networking with the right people? Because I know I'm huge on this. Yeah, I think you know, networking is definitely something that you can talk about in detail because property networking, we all go to it. I think a lot of that is, is about learning, yeah. is about you know, not, not being lonely because it can be you know, when you're an entrepreneur. And just meeting other people and talking about the same issues you're having. People in that room, you know, the chance of someone in that room having money, you know, is not as high as one of your networking events where it's like business people, where it's just, you know, business owners. They are the kind of people you want to target because they ha they're busy doing their business stuff. They, you know, and correct me if I'm wrong, but some of them are like, Property, yeah, I want to kind of do it, but you know what, can you do it? I'm busy here. Yeah, it's exactly that. And so I think people need to, and people don't do this, is go to non-property networking events. I mean, I've been to oh, I don't know, hundreds and I host one. I've only ever raised 10,000 pounds from a property networking event. And he yeah. knew me from the podcast anyway, but he kind of said that event secured it. But I've raised 800 grand from my, my phone. You've got to look at percentages and effort and it's like, you know, it's really not fun having to go out, you know, so just be kind of specific with your networking. 
And telling everyone what you do, a really good tip on that is, well, telling everyone what you do. Yeah. So, I mean, let's say the postman comes to you, you see him every day probably, right? You know, our one's really friendly, we live in the countryside, everyone's really friendly, right? It's not like London, you Londoners. Um, and so, when he comes, he has a full-blown chat with us. I have like 10 opportunities to just say, oh yeah, no, you know, actually on the weekend I was just over my um, refurb that I'm doing because I invest in property, but don't worry about it. And, and every single time he comes, there's a conversation. Just mention it. You know, uh, the, when people say to you, hey, how are you? Like, obviously this is context dependent, but instead of saying, yeah, fine, had a good weekend, say, oh, you know what, actually, this weekend I, I was showing some investors around my property. Just, it's so easy to kind of get it into conversation. Let's not just be so like British and politically correct, just yeah. oh, I'm good. Get it in conversation. Talk about it. And I think people hold back, I don't know if anyone watching, where people think, oh, I've just started my property journey. I don't want to seem like imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. And, you know, get over that. This is your life, your journey. Uh, start talking about what you do because just little conversations like this can lead on to other things. And Tay's just hit the nail on the head. It's great to go to a property event to learn mortgage updates, the market, um, for your background knowledge. But I can guarantee you the person that you're looking at across the room wearing a suit, he's not your next investor. He's a saucer. He's, he's looking at you. He's, looking, looking, at, he's <laughs> looking at you thinking, is that person my next <laughs> investor? So yeah, definitely branch out. And I always say think outside the box when you network. Mm. Um, because again, like you just said, I've had it first experience. Business owners, they cash flow, they're profitable, and they want you to be the property expert. So if I'm a business owner and Tej comes to me and says, I need X amount, I don't want to worry or, or feel like I'm going to sort of come on top of you thinking, well, I, I'm the property expert, you're borrowing my money. Tej wants me to be that individual that just goes, there's the money. Um, and I think someone put it up on social media the other day, I reshared it, was saying that someone who lends 500 pound will give you this big speech, look after my money. The 50K to 5 million will just say, money transferred. That's it, 100%. The just, smaller just, amounts are the hardest ones, honestly. It like, just sums yeah. it up. Um, so, amazing. So, when it comes to raising capital, how do you protect yourself? Because protection is a big thing, not only for you, but for an investor. Because uh, do you tend to work with retail investors? Would you recommend straight away going with retail investors or look for the higher caliber investor? You know what? It, it, it's kind of been a bit of both. I think... To protect myself, I leave it to my solicitors. They got liability insurance. Yeah. They can do AML. They can do KYC. I pass it straight onto them. Yeah. Um, obviously, I do my kind of you know checks and you know proof of funds and that. But really, the solicitors run their checks, their bankruptcy checks, their company houses checks, and you know verify the ID things like that. Um, and if they need to sign off, um, you know being sophisticated or high net worth. I let them kind of deal with it. Um, I would say that you know what when you said protect me is interesting because. The main way I protect myself is not taking, you know, laundered money, not to <laughs> Pablo Escobar's like tenth yeah, son giving me money. That. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the main way I protect is my investors. Like uh, apart from that, I don't really think about how am I protected. I think how are they protected, and actually how are they protected, working with me and against me because that, that that's what really matters to me. So you know, I think the main way, well, the main way that underlies everything is trust. Yeah. And that's not really tangible, right? We can't put trust on a, a spreadsheet or in a document. But, but that is the case, right? Like someone sees this over nine, 10 months, and they, and I think another thing, right, is they see the number of followers and they say, listen, all I need to do is put one post out, Ted didn't pay my money back, and I'm- Ruins you. Exactly, Ruins so you. they have an insurance, which I didn't realize. Um, but you know, there's obviously got loan agreements, we have personal guarantees, you've got first charge, second charges, restrictions. It's always a discussion. You know, if someone gives 25 grand, they can't get a first charge. Yeah. If someone gives 100, they can have a charge. Yeah. Um, so it's all about talking to them and saying, look, what do you want? What do you need to feel comfortable? Um, and it's always a discussion based on trust, but also I'm one, always one for contracts based on what are you happy with, you know, this contract saying um, as well. But you know what, the smaller investors or the, the more retail investors are, like you said earlier about 500 pounds, they're much harder to work with and that money is a bit of a bigger percentage of their net worth. Whereas when you start to go above that, I mean, you know, I bought a property auction a few weeks ago and I texted one of my previous investors um, and I just said, listen, I've got a deal, 150 grand, because I'll get back to you tomorrow. A few hours later, Ted, send the loan agreement, literally thumbs up, emoji, that's it. Done. And yeah, that was 150 grand, so he's sort of more in the sophisticated kind of level I'd put him. That's what you want? Yeah. Like, uh, you know, so it's a tricky one because at the start you're like, oh, someone's offered me 25 grand, I want to take it. So 
It's that much. Yeah. Do you, do you know something that's really important? Note this down if you're just starting and you, you're looking to raise capital. Sometimes borrowing less is more risky because that person might be lending. Always something you should ask is, is this your life savings? You know, mm -hmm. um, Do you need this money retracted in six months if something went wrong? You know, Do you need this money to live on? And ultimately you need to do these checks because investment, uh, you've heard me say it many times, it's glamorized so much. Like you could be messing with the wrong person when you borrow their money. And people um, have, yeah. I've, I've, I've seen it happen. Um, so when you borrow money, really think of this as hard earned money. Someone's mm. been working perhaps their life, this is a SAS pension, it's, it's their uh, family funds, but they can, they can afford to use it. It's always hard earned money. So anytime you're ever borrowing, you need to know that this money can come back or you have a contingency or something, plan B. So raise capital, build your business, get into property, but really value and understand that you know what money actually means. Something else I wanna bring up just to finish before we go on to part three is some of my investors that I use, I've never even met them. Yep. And the reason I've done that is you must be using sources such as LinkedIn, has a lot of money on it, put time into LinkedIn, you're very big on uh, Instagram, works very well, it's very visual. Your mm -hmm. brand, Tej Talks, um, has done very well. So how has, just to finish on, how has social media played a part in drawing in the investors? Yeah, so I mean, well, it is the part. You know, it yeah. is everything. It is, and, it is. and you know, I think like, you know, the networking events, you look at, say, the podcast, you know, having, I think we're up to like 600,000 listens in two years. How on earth am I going to have 600,000 touch points yeah. with all these people at different times? That it's impo it is impossible. And it's in 100 countries. So I don't care how many air miles I'll be picking up. Like, it's impossible. Um, so the efficiency statistically speaks for itself. Yeah. But, and that point about touch points is everything. Because you might follow me today on Instagram. Okay, you see a post. Oh, cool. You see a story. Oh, podcast. Oh, okay. Oh, book. Oh, okay. Next thing you know, we're at seven touch points. Yeah. You've got 100 grand. I'm asking Probably for 100 grand. There now. And you're like, and actually to summarize social media, pretty much all the conversations I have with investors is, hey, Tej, um, how much do you need? What's the duration? What's the interest? What's the security? Oh. Not, oh, hey, how are you? What are you working on? It's just, Tej, three or four questions because they already know everything. There's nothing to talk about. Yeah. That is the beauty of social media. You know serious people when you speak to them. Oh there, yeah, there's, yeah, yeah. There's fluff and then there's yeah. someone who knows their There's money. a lot of fluff, yeah. So amazing points there. Tej, amazing. We're gonna move on to part three now where we're gonna change the conversation up. We're gonna talk more about what it takes to be the entrepreneur, the mindset to keep within property, to the good, the bad, the ugly. And then we're just gonna to touch on a few points at the end about alternative investments. We're gonna to touch on a few uh, hot topics right now, crypto and a few other things and what Tej might be involved in. So stick around, join us on part three.